Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Ron Hurst. Thank you, Carter, and, uh, and everyone. I'm so pleased to be in Charleston. I never miss an opportunity to come to the Holy City. It's one of those very special places, whether you're interested in historic architecture or not. A grand place to be. Now, most modern impressions of the early South center on white-columned plantation houses <laughs> and rustic log cabins. They may also include uh, gentry planters of English extraction, backwoodsmen in coonskin caps, and the enslaved, as you see in the center here. For many people, the popular image stops there. While all of these elements are, in fact, a part of the early South story, the full picture is so much richer and more complex. As every Charlestonian knows, the region was also home to people of French Huguenot descent, like Georgia planter James Genelat. And there were those of German extraction, such as Virginia quilter Amelia Locke, as well as Moravian families, like that of Anna Maria Benzian, whose clan moved from Eastern Europe to the North Carolina Piedmont before the Revolution. There were Scottish Presbyterians, like the Reverend William Hume of Tennessee, and there was a large Jewish community represented by men like Dr. John de Siqueira of Williamsburg, Miss Bremie Jones of Beaufort, South Carolina, and other enslaved people accounted for a huge part of the population. And there were many more Native Americans than we know about, men like Tomochichi, chief of the Yamacra in coastal Georgia. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Southerners were not the two-dimensional Anglo-African society that's depicted in popular media. Instead, they were a surprisingly diverse and multicultural people right from the beginning. Now, historians have long known this to be the case because it's readily apparent, apparent in the period documents. But the objects made and used by early Southerners also reveal that compelling story in rich and visual detail. From fine art to utilitarian objects, the material record of the early South is much more complicated and much more visually arresting than many observers suspect, and that's what I'd like to explore with you this evening. I'll begin by sampling the imported materials, which are often ignored in studies of this kind, but imports are an important part of the landscape because they so often tell us about the buyer's cultural and economic affinities. And make no mistake, staggering quantities of European and Asian goods flowed into the South from many points, especially after 1700. They usually arrived in one of two ways. Wealthy Southerners could obtain such goods directly from their factors in England and Scotland. Southern cash crops, tobacco, wheat, rice, indigo, deerskins, barrel staves and such, were shipped for sale to ports in Britain and sometimes the West Indies, and the credit that resulted from their sale allowed Southern planters to order manufactured goods directly by return shipment. Alternatively, Southern consumers at all economic levels could purchase goods directly from local retailers like William Prentice, whose Williamsburg, Virginia storehouse is still standing on the Duke of Gloucester Street today. Built in 1739, its interior probably resembled the one that was recreated by Colonial Williamsburg at nearby Greenhouse Store about 20 years ago. Now, one of the best views into the world of early Southern retail is found in this 1767 ad advertising broadside for Tarpley, Thompson & Company, another Williamsburg merchant. And I quote, just imported from London and Bristol, it proclaims, and then goes on to list literally scores of different types of textiles, followed by goods such as these, handsome Wilton carpets, silk calamanco and leather shoes, hats of all prices, table china, glass and earthenware, ornamental china, haberdashery of all kinds, gloves, prints, handsome looking glasses, sconce glasses, dressing glasses, ironware, cutlery of all sorts, handsome painted tea boards, waiters and bread baskets, silverware of all sorts, jewelry, gold and silver lace, 
and the best quote of all, and a very great variety of almost every article that can be thought of suitable for this country, end quote. Now don't miss the visuals around the outside of this piece. The text is framed by a border that is bedecked with coffee pots, teacups, candlesticks, tea boards, gloves, stockings, shoes, hats, and more. And lest we think that such wares were available only in coastal towns like Williamsburg, Annapolis, and Charleston, I can confirm that merchants in the mountains of Western Virginia and in the Western Carolinas offered many of these same goods long before the Revolution. In 1772, merchant John Hook in Bedford County, Virginia, provided customers with backgammon boards, china cups, feather plumes, cloaks, gowns, white salt glaze stoneware, creamware, transfer printed teapots, enameled sauce boats, fine table linen, you name it, he had it for sale in 1772, four years before the revolution. So much for coonskin caps and deprivation on the frontier. Now, perhaps not surprisingly, stylish attire topped the list of imported European goods for southern householders, and here are some examples. This 1750s gown was made of Spitalfield silk from London, but belonged to Elizabeth Dandridge in Tidewater, Virginia. And this very similar example was worn by a Charleston woman about 20 years later. And this gown, made of cotton from East India, belonged to a woman called Ann Breckenridge in the back country of Virginia about 1810. Martha Washington married George Washington in these shoes in 1759. They came from a London shoemaker. And Caroline Reed of Suffolk, Virginia, carried this imported English fan about 20 years after the Revolutionary War. Now, despite the international origins of the various materials from which all of these things were made, all of these finished goods were imported to the South from Britain. That was the law of the day. Ceramics followed a similar course coming to the region from potteries in England, Scotland, and Ireland in huge numbers. The range included cheap slipware like this dish excavated in Williamsburg and British Delft akin to this cup excavated from the yard of the Hayward Washington House here in Charleston. Salt glaze stoneware found its way to places as rural as the North Carolina Piedmont and as urbanized as Charleston's Broad Street. Cream colored earthenware was shipped almost everywhere and pearlware like this teacup made it all the way from England to Tennessee's Elk River Valley by 1810. And mind you, this was all long before the advent of mechanized travel. Transporting ceramics over the mountains, very difficult in the 18th century. Chinese export also arrived in quantity. We see tea wares like this rare early 18th century service used by the first members of the Drayton family to live at Drayton Hall. This 1780s equipage with gilding that was added in England before it was shipped to South Carolina was owned by the next generation of the Drayton family. And this service was used by the Lear family in Washington, D.C. in the 1790s. Tablewares appear too, among them Robert Beverly's massive 1764 order for Blandfield Plantation on the Rappahannock River in Virginia. And the Macon family service, which was used in the Virginia Piedmont, and a particularly elegant and costly service from Drayton Hall. And there was ornamental china, this tall and colorful garniture with details richly adorned in gilding originally sat on a mantle at Drayton Hall beginning in the 1780s. It's one of the most ornate examples known from the early South. Silver and silver plate came from the mother country too, far more of it than most people realize, as evidenced by this London salver made, by, made for Tidewater, Virginia's Granbury family in 1771 and these outstanding silver plate candlesticks ordered by Virginian John Park Custis and his Maryland wife, Eleanor Calvert, in 1774. This avant-garde London salver in the neoclassic taste was made for William and Hannah Ainsley Moultrie of South Carolina in 1772. And this large English cup, and it is about 15 inches tall, was fashioned to commemorate a horse race run in Chowan County, North Carolina in 1754. Can you see the engraved horse and jockey on the front? English silver was pouring into the South in vast amounts. <laughs>
Perhaps the least well understood of the British imports to the South is furniture. But diligent research over the last decade has turned up a wealth of well-documented pieces, and we're beginning to see a pattern. Most of these goods were of a straightforward design, often termed the neat and plain style by 18th century consumers, like this clock made in Glasgow, Scotland, and used by the last royal governor of Virginia at the palace in Williamsburg, or this English sideboard table with its Italian marble top, which was owned by the Southern family in Southern Maryland at their plantation called the Plains. Southern consumers, when ordering such pieces from Britain, often used terms such as good and well-made of their kind. They were looking for quality, but not usually ornament, except in some cases. These are the exceptions, perhaps none as remarkable for its expense and its elegance as this English desk and bookcase made for John Drayton and used by him at Drayton Hall. This object has all the available additions from purely ornamental carving to exotic African veneer woods right down to fire gilt Rococo hardware on the drawers. Drayton was making a statement about his position and taste even with his imported furniture. In short, early Southerners imported everything from fine art to furniture to architectural stonework to wall coverings and virtually all of it came from or through Great Britain, regardless of origin. Obviously, such goods were outward symbols of the owner's wealth, but they also revealed cultural empathies. The original users of these things sought to follow the latest British fashions by acquiring goods that were trendy in the mother country. Now, as I said earlier, looking at imports is instructive, but the clearest hallmarks of Southern cultural affinities are seen in the goods actually made by early Southerners. As in any society, artists and artisans produce objects that echo their own backgrounds and often those of their customers. Not surprisingly, the dominant English presence observed with imported goods is also seen in much of the furniture, silver, painted goods, and other things that were produced, especially in the coastal plain of the early South. Let's look at a few examples of those. The earliest southern ceramic production was limited to the coastal plain. Utilitarian vessels akin to these were fashioned in very small quantities at a number of 17th century sites in the Chesapeake, and most were directly modeled on contemporary English forms. That's true of this chamber pot and colander, both made in the 1620s and found at Walston hometown in James City County, Virginia. Similarly, this bird nesting bottle made at the Rogers Pottery in Yorktown, Virginia about a century later looks exactly like its English counterparts. This sugar dish and teapot of the 1770s excavated here in Charleston. They are almost certainly English imports, but there's also a very slight chance that they were made by English potter John Bartlam, who established a pottery here in Charleston in 1765 and made goods akin to these. And that's the point, of course. If they are Charleston made, you can scarcely detect the difference between them and English examples. And that's what low country patrons wanted. Now, English influence is also strong in several other media. This likeness of Francis Park Custis was painted near Williamsburg in 1722 by the Jacqueline Broadnax Limner. And although the artist's name is not known to us, his technique is unmistakably English. Depicted here in her teens, young Fanny's loosely arranged attire is likely based on engraved images of English noblewomen rather than something that this teenage girl actually wore. In furniture, consider this well-known Charleston Library bookcase from the 1770s. The maker very obviously lifted the design right out of Thomas Chippendale's Gentleman and Cabinet Maker's Director, the premier English pattern book of the day. And English influence is even deeply reaching into the backcountry at an early date, as evidenced by this tall case clock from Frankfort, Kentucky. The case was made about 1800 by William Lowry, whose molding profiles and overall composition directly pattern themselves on English norms. Uh, 
Even the floral inlay on the pediment appears to be a British import. And note that virtually identical floral inlays were used by Lowry's contemporaries here in Charleston, also imported from Britain. Now, we could make the same observations about English influence with regard to silver and needlework and architectural details, but the pattern's very well established. So let's move on to look at other less apparent cultural influences in the early South. And England is not the only source of British influence that we find in the region. Irish artisans left their stamp as well. Although fabricated on the shores of Virginia's Rappahannock River in the mid-18th century, a number of pieces of furniture, including these two tea tables, exhibit all the hallmarks of contemporary Irish furniture. Those springy cabriole legs, the pointed feet, the heavily shaped rails, they're all identical to furniture made in Dublin and Limerick and Shannon. At least two still unidentified Irish artisans settled near one of the small towns on the Rappahannock River and simply continued to make furniture just as they'd learned to do it in Ireland. The only, only the objects Virginia associations and their execution in North American cabinet woods reveal their true origin. Now how do we account for this phenomenon? There was enormous growth in the Chesapeake in wheat production during the third quarter of the 18th century and surprisingly, more than half the annual tonnage was shipped not to England, but to Ireland. That coincided with a resurgence of indentured servitude in the Chesapeake, and most of those newly arriving indentured servants were Irish immigrants. They came to the port of Baltimore, but their indentures were sold to planters and masters throughout the upper Chesapeake, mainly in Maryland and in Virginia as far south as the Rappahannock hence Irish cabinet makers near the town of Tappahannock, Virginia. The Welsh were here too. And although physical evidence of their presence is more difficult to find, it is here nonetheless. By way of example, look at this hearth chair made in Anne Arundel County, Maryland, near Annapolis. Now you've probably never seen another like it, but it's a dead ringer for contemporary hearth chairs from rural Wales. These seats were used throughout the 18th century in Welsh farm kitchens to facilitate cooking and other hearth-oriented work. Not surprisingly, the area around Annapolis saw a hefty influx of Welsh settlement in the second quarter of the 18th century. Scottish influences are apparent as well and far more abundant, most often in furniture. Scores, and I mean scores, of Scottish cabinet makers settled in both urban and rural areas in the Chesapeake and in the Low Country. One of them was Robert Walker, not to be confused with the cabinet maker of the same name here in Charleston. This Robert Walker arrived in Virginia in the 1740s, having been raised and almost certainly trained near Aberdeen in eastern Scotland. Walker's furniture exhibits a heavy, bold, and Georgian feel that was common in coastal Scotland, but rarely seen in American furniture of his day. You find it here in the scale of the individual ornaments, like the legs and the styles, and also in the florid carving on the knees and the splats of the chairs. Scottish and Scots-Irish characteristics were abundant in the southern backcountry, too. Immigrants carried the traits as they moved down the Shenandoah Valley from Pennsylvania or across the mountains from southern coastal settlements. We see their presence in this robustly scaled wainscot chair, which descended in the Gilmore family of Rockbridge County, Virginia. The Scots-Irish Gilmores settled in the Shenandoah Valley about 1750, having come uh, from North Britain by way of Pennsylvania. Their chair's maker is not known to us, but it resembles 18th century provincial Scottish and Irish chairs in both design and construction. And colleagues at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts, known to us as MESDA, recently documented another backcountry group with Scottish ties. These three pieces are likely the work of Scotsman Amos Alexander, working near present-day Charlotte, North Carolina. Looking at the bracket feet and the wide inlays on these pieces, we see that same heavy Georgian scale observed earlier in the furniture of Robert Walker along the coast. And the Scots pursued other trades as well. Painter Cosmo Alexander from Aberdeen created these likenesses of Samuel Griffin and Sarah Waters in Williamsburg in the 1770s. 
His works have a softer focus and that differs pretty sharply from most of the contemporary English painters working in the South. And Scottish silversmith Alexander Petrie was a leading Charleston metalsmith during the 1750s, fabricating some of the most ornate silver hollowware in the coastal South. A comparison with contemporary Scottish silver like this Edinburgh coffee pot reveals the direct transfer of both ornamental and structural details from coastal Scotland to coastal South Carolina. Now looking next at continental Europe, we find that transplanted German cultures also thrived in the South. As Tom Savage demonstrated a number of years ago, the German cabinet maker Martin Fenninger worked in Charleston during the 1770s and early 80s and produced particularly handsome and sophisticated goods strongly grounded in his German aesthetic training. You see evidence of that in the robust Baroque shaping of the pediment on this bookcase and the shapely top on the chest of drawers from the same shop. But it's even more apparent in the marquetry decorating the bookcase and in the inlays on the feet of the chest. Indeed, it would be difficult to find another piece of pre-revolutionary American-made furniture that matches the quality and erudition of this bookcase that you can see today, of course, at the Hayward Washington House. Now, German traditions were even more pronounced and more tenacious in the backcountry, where some communities spoke German exclusively as late as the 1840s. Artisans in these areas made distinctive and sometimes old-fashioned goods like this tall clock from Shenandoah County, Virginia. Its rare swelled or Bombay base, together with the arched hood, the cluster of five finials on top, and the case door with a round window are all typical of Dutch and German Baroque aesthetics from the middle of the 18th century but the Virginia case was made about 1800 when most of these details were long out of fashion in Europe. There was a strong conser conservative streak in many backcountry Germanic communities. The relationship between the earlier continental traditions is readily apparent in the case of this German clock made about 1750. And note the subtle Bombay base appearing once again on this clock attributed to Johannes Krauss working in the Moravian town of Salem, North Carolina. Krauss, too, was of German birth and brought his ideas with him. Of course, painted blanket chests often signify Germanic cultures, and the backcountry produced them in numbers. German immigrants and their offspring moved out of Pennsylvania and down the Great Wagon Road in huge numbers beginning in the 1720s. Their progress can be traced by various schools of chest decoration found along the way. Here are just three examples. The work of painter Johannes Spittler is found in the northern end of the Shenandoah Valley. And at the southern end, a striking group of chests, including this one, was made in Wythe County. And across the line in East Tennessee, we find this example from Greene County. Each of these groups exhibits its own combination of details, techniques, and palettes. But note the continuing thread of Germanic symbolism the tulips, the vines, the abstract lines and shapes, and so on, each of these details was fraught with meaning for those in sync with German culture. Similar cultural transfer is seen with Germanic potters who worked in several backcountry locales, including the North Carolina Piedmont. Artisans in the St. Asaph's district in modern Alamance County fabricated sugar pots, dishes, tankards, and a variety of other vessel forms that clearly express their maker's Germanic heritage. The artisans, Jacob Albright, Henry Loy, Solomon Loy, and several others, were interrelated and interdependent. The decorative traditions that they brought from Germany to Pennsylvania and eventually to North Carolina were little influenced by outside forces and remained constant over a long period of time. And that has much to do with the relatively close nature of many Germanic communities. In addition to fabricating new objects, backcountry Germans were also adept at putting their stamp on imported goods from other cultures. In 1782, a Germanic artisan covered the rim of this imported English pewter dish with an array of engraved ornament. Originally a plain serving vessel of inexpensive material, the dish was utterly transformed when it was boldly decorated for Hannah Fischel, 
of Shepherdstown, West Virginia, a market town in the upper Potomac River Valley. And the French, of course, left their mark on the South too, along, although uh, often in different districts and at different times. Now, the first wave came about the turn of the 18th century. With the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, French Protestants, or Huguenots, or Huguenots if you're from Virginia, fled France, and several hundred of them settled in Virginia by 1710. Their cultural legacy is apparent uh, in early Virginia turn chairs, a number of which have been recovered in southeastern Virginia and adjacent areas of North Carolina. All have back rails that are square or rectangular in cross section rather than round. Now, this technique was unknown in British chair making circles until the 19th century, but it was common on French chairs and other turned furniture forms beginning in the 17th century. The Huguenots also played a, a very significant role here in the Low Country. And there again, we find a few chairs with construction details and other elements that are quite different from those encountered on contemporary British turned and joined chairs. This one was found here in coastal South Carolina in the late 1920s. In addition to its square rather than turned structural elements, the chair features an open back frame that was designed to be used with a tied on back cushion, another French detail that we almost never see in Britain before the 19th century. And from the Georgia Piedmont, Consider this chair, one of a very large group springing from a highly focused chair-making tradition. As Dale Couch has shown, with their arched and spurred back slats and very crisp turnings, these chairs closely resemble contemporary examples from continental Europe. This one is among the earliest versions of the pattern, and it was one that was widely produced in the Georgia Piedmont from the 1780s through the early 20th century. And the design, so unlike that on most early American ladder back chairs, probably owes its presence in Georgia to the establishment of French and German settlements along the South Carolina side of the Savannah River during the 18th century. Over time, these cultures moved southwest into the Georgia Piedmont and simply took their craft traditions with them. A similar pattern appears in early Louisiana chairs. Like the Georgia examples, they feature arched and spurred slats in the French tradition, but they also differ from American and British chairs in other ways. The Georgia chairs are made of hickory and similar woods that were intended to be painted. The Louisiana versions are almost always made of red mulberry or black walnut and were stained and finished like more formal furniture, very much in the French fashion. Also in the French mode is the presence of curved side seat rails on these chairs. American and British ladder backs have straight seat rails. The curved versions, typically French, provide a more generous seating area. No commentary there. <laughs> you know, of course, that Louisiana was a part of that territory that traded back and forth between France and Spain several times, hence the fully developed French culture that survives there in many ways to this day. The strength of French traditions was not dampened even with the transfer of the territory to the United States with the Louisiana Purchase. And while on the subject of Louisiana, I think there are few better examples of French influence in the South than this New Orleans armoire. While the populace of other American and cities stored textiles in chests of drawers, double chests, and clothes presses, inhabitants of the lower Mississippi Valley preferred the French armoire. Like the just described chairs, this concept first arrived in Louisiana when armoires were imported directly from France by French immigrants. Migrating French and French Caribbean cabinet makers later produced Creole versions of the form in New Orleans and other lower Mississippi centers. Louisiana armoires follow the French form with large double doors, a band of interior drawers, those short square section cabrio legs, and foot-long brass hinges. In the early 19th century, with the integration of non-French artisans into New Orleans, some cabinet makers began to decorate their French wares with Anglo decoration. That trend uh, is seen here, for example, because the case, though French in form, is completely covered with Anglo-American inlaid designs. This object and others like it illustrate the melding of French storage forms with Anglo-American aesthetics.
Now, bearing in mind the shape of those French legs we were just looking at, we'll move up the Mississippi River to the Ohio and up the Ohio into Mason County in northeastern Kentucky, where we find the very same legs on local case furniture. A variety of influences shaped Mason County cabinet wares. Settlers from Northern Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania brought mid-Atlantic craft traditions to that area when they migrated down the Ohio from Pittsburgh. But at the same time, boats filled with Kentucky produce were traveling down the Ohio and down the Mississippi to the Gulf Coast and then returning from New Orleans with goods and new ideas. These outstanding objects illustrate the disparate forces at work even in the backcountry. The canted corners and the inlays on the chest to the left relate to very similar examples from the mid-Atlantic coast and probably came to Kentucky with a family of cabinet makers from Prince William County, Virginia. But those short squared cabriole legs on both of these chests are quite clearly French. The idea almost certainly came to northeastern Kentucky by way of the river trade with French-controlled New Orleans. And before leaving the subject of French influence, let's look briefly at painting. French immigration to America's Atlantic coast slowed to a trickle during the last decades of the colonial period, but that changed after the revolution. With the French as our wartime allies against the British, the post-war period in the new United States saw a modest influx of French artists and artisans. Among them was one Monsieur Boucher, even his first name isn't known, but his portraits in Maryland and Washington, D.C. are very, very French in style and execution. You see here the Murray sisters of Annapolis on the left and Washington's Anne Ogle Taylor and her daughters on the right. Now, so far we've looked mainly at nationalistic groups, but religious communities also left clear physical evidence of their presence in the objects that they made. Among the most fascinating in my mind are the so-called Salzburgers, a group of Protestant Christians who were expelled from modern day Austria by the Catholic Church, the Archdiocese of Salzburg. Seeking a home that would allow them to worship in their own way, many Salzburgers fled to other European countries, but one group landed in the new colony of Georgia in 1734, having negotiated for land with the colony's founder, James Oglethorpe. The Salzburgers planted a town called Ebenezer. Two years later, they moved to a more desirable site on the bluffs of the Savannah River. New Ebenezer, as the community was called, was essentially an, Anglo, or an Austro German village in Georgia. Their language, their worship, and all of their craft traditions were strictly German, and they naturally continued to make German goods like this table. With its Baroque turnings and its splayed legs and its removable top, this table could easily be mistaken for a piece of continental woodworking, was it not for the fact that the table is made entirely of North American woods and was owned by a Salzburger family in New Ebenezer. Members of the Society of Friends, or Quakers, also moved and resided in groups. As with the Salzburgers, that facilitated the movement of traditions from one place to another intact. A group of interrelated Quaker families from the Delaware Valley in Pennsylvania moved to the North Carolina Piedmont in the 1750s, landing in Guilford, Rad, uh, Rad, Randolph, and Chatham counties. There they continued to make the very same kinds of goods that they'd fabricated in their prior homes. This striking dish dresser is a case in point. Found in adjacent Alamance County about 75 years ago, it's part of a tightly structured Piedmont Carolina group identified by June Lucas of Mesda in recent years. Jesse Needham, also of Quaker extraction, made this high chest in northern Randolph County. And like the dresser, it has a very strong Pennsylvania Quaker accent. And potter William Dennis, or his son Thomas, made this earthenware dish. The Quakers, whose ancestors came from Ireland to New Jersey and Pennsylvania before moving to North Carolina, the Dennises were among a number of Quaker potters working in Randolph County. In general, Quaker craftsmen trained their own children or apprenticed them to members of their own faith and that kept all of these craft traditions compact and intact for long periods of time. 
and certainly no discussion of Southern religious communities would be complete without reference to the Moravians of the North Carolina Piedmont. In fact, this is a subject that deserves its own lecture. The Moravian Church established new communities as it branched out from its North American base in Pennsylvania. The most successful was at Salem, North Carolina, which grew from an outpost in the 1760s into a thriving and commercially successful town. In the process, craft traditions were transplanted almost without alteration from Europe to the backcountry. For example, this desk and bookcase is the work of Johannes Krauss, who trained in Germany before emigrating to North Carolina with other Moravians. It could easily pass for a piece of furniture from the Hanover region in Germany. And this chair, signed by Karsten Peterson, looks exactly like contemporary Biedermeyer furniture. That's because Peterson was born and probably trained on the German-Danish border where similar goods were the norm. And then there is the Moravian pottery, which is laden with meaningful and also beautiful detailing that springs directly from well-preserved Germanic traditions. Now, less well-known is the broad array of goods that was made in the South by enslaved men and women. Although people of African descent accounted for a sizable portion of the Southern workforce, it's often impossible to document their productions with any precision, but that doesn't mean the objects don't exist. In 1743, Spence Monroe signed an indenture with Virginia cabinet maker Robert Walker, whose products we discussed earlier. Walker promised to teach both Monroe and his slave, a man called Muddy, quote, the trade and mystery of a joiner. Now when looking at objects like this tea table from Walker's shop, we must assume that someone like Muddy had a hand in the production. The same is true of goods from the shop of Charleston silversmith Alexander Petrie. When Petrie died in 1768, his estate included an enslaved silversmith called Abraham, who was then sold to another Charleston silversmith. So again, when looking at objects like this salver bearing Petrie's mark, we should assume that an enslaved hand like that of Abraham had something to do with its production somewhere along the way. There are thousands of similar examples of enslaved artisans working throughout the South. Unfortunately, there are also a few better documented instances of the work of African Americans. One is an armchair made in the joinery at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello in the Virginia Piedmont under the direction of John Hemings, an enslaved woodworker. The chair is clearly based on seating furniture that Jefferson himself saw and recorded during his travels to France, but it was made in Albemarle County, Virginia, and likely by African hands. And we have a high degree of confidence that this stoneware storage jar was made by David Jarbour, a formerly enslaved potter working for Hugh Smith in Alexandria, Virginia in the 1820s. Jarbour saved up enough money to buy his own freedom and eventually that of his wife. And it can be useful to consider images like this one by John Rose of South Carolina. Here Rose depicts enslaved men and women on his plantation enjoying a period of free time. They're performing a West African stick dance to music provided by several African musical instruments, including a banjar, which is the ancestor of the banjo, and a percussion instrument called a shigura, which is a gourd filled with seeds and encased in a long net that looks like a scarf. Both of these instruments were likely produced by the people who were using them. Few of the objects made by Native Americans in the early South have been identified, but the story of their interactions with European settlers is richly depicted in contemporary likenesses by British artisans. The most notable is James Oglethorpe presenting the Yamacra Indians to the Georgia trustees. One year after Oglethorpe established the Georgia colony, he returned to London with a delegation of Yamacra Indians. This scene illustrates his presentation of them to 25 of the Georgia trustees in London. Oglethorpe's transport of Native American delegation, the Native American delegation was one of several attempts by English colonists to strengthen the bonds between the two cultures, mainly by introducing the Indians to the splendors of England. English newspaper reports of the day recorded the Yamacraw's activities on a daily basis, often noting that they were, quote, naked except at the waist, 
Chief Tomochichi is pictured here at, uh, with his left, at the left with his hand extended. The single Indian woman is portrayed in English dress to provide a more modest covering. She is Tomochichi's wife, Sinachi, and the pink gown reportedly came back with her to Georgia and was worn on special occasions for years afterwards. 28 years after the Yamacross traveled to London, a Cherokee delegation was escorted by Henry Timber Timberlake to the English capital. One of the three natives was Chief Kunishote. In this engraving, the subject's combination of European and native art attire was meant to suggest harmony between the cultures. Those round medals Kunishote wore at his neck date to 1761 and commemorate the marriage of King George III and Charlotte of Mecklenburg, and that crescent-shaped silver gorget at his chest is engraved with the initials GR3 for King George III. And yet the most striking aspect of the portrait is Kunishote's grip on a scalping knife, a visual reminder of the tenuous relationship between the Cherokee and the colonists living in the South. Now, Later in the early 19th century, efforts to fold southern Indians into the mainstream society produced objects like this distinctly non-Indian sampler. It is inscribed, quote, wrought by Christine Baker, Choctaw Mission School, Mayhew, June 9th, 1830. The Society of Foreign Missions established schools in the rural south for the education and, quote, civilization of Native American children in the early 19th century. One was set up for the Choctaw in 1821 at Mayhew, Mississippi. Parents were to leave their children at the boarding school where they were to be taught to read, to write, and to practice a trade. Young Christine Baker was 13 years old when she made her American-style sampler at the Choctaw Mission School and had been there for two years. Like all the pupils, she had been required to relinquish her Indian name upon taking up residency in the school. She was apparently named for a donor from Boston. Now the passage of time and the dispersal of ethnic groups in the South brought many changes to the region, some visible in images of the land. The early 18th century English compulsion to control the landscape by rigorously surveying the terrain is perhaps best illustrated here in a view of Savannah as it stood on the 29th of March, 1734. Therein, the town, as laid out by Oglethorpe, reflects his military background and egalitarian approach. In the extreme contrast between the limitless bounds of the frontier stretching to the horizon and the regimented layout of the town itself illustrates England's desire to impose order on nature. George Beck's 1805 depiction of Boone's Knoll on the Kentucky River stands in sharp contrast to this approach almost a century later. As Southerners and other Americans strove to differentiate themselves from the mother country in the early 19th century, they embraced the ruggedness of the frontier. Englishman Beck painted a view of the Kentucky River that romanticized the beauty of America's wild open spaces. In similar fashion, while earlier generations of artisans in the South firmly tied their products to specific British and European cultural roots, that pattern receded as the population moved west and southwest in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Backcountry products gradually took on a look that was more American and less European. Aspects of the American fancy movement appeared in visually compelling objects like this painted chest from Green County, Georgia. As vibrant as it is now, consider that when it was new, the red you see here was salmon pink. And this polychromed mantle from Pittsylvania County, Virginia, also speaks to the new penchant for goods in the so-called fancy style. And Southern craftsmen began to develop forms and motifs in direct response to the available resources and new American cultural trends. Sullivan County, Tennessee potter Leonard Kane fashioned wares that exploited his region's unusual orange clay and feature abstract manganese decoration that differs wildly from the products that were then being made along the coast. Christopher Hahn, working in Greene County, Tennessee 20 years later, 
fabricated wares with equally abstract ornament. And a desk made in Greene County, Tennessee, offers an excellent example of the emerging American aesthetic. The object's exterior is generic and suggests little to us about its origin. But the interior is intricately inlaid with ornaments grouped around an engaging and somewhat naive interpretation of the American spread eagle. So what do we take away from this review? I think we need a new focus. Since the 1950s, students of Southern material culture have spent a great deal of time and published a great many books and articles trying to persuade the rest of the decorative arts world that remarkable furniture, silver, firearms, ceramics, and other goods were made in the South, something that most folks outside the region were frankly unwilling to believe. We don't need to do that anymore. A host of scholars from the pioneering Paul Burroughs in the 1930s to Frank Horton with the creation of Mesda in 1965 to the newest interns in the field have made the case on a thousand fronts. The research is solid and the question is settled. This culture produced extraordinary things. No, our goods don't look like those from Boston and Philadelphia and New York, but that's as it should be. Man-made objects are always a reflection of the time and the place in which they were produced. Well, now that we no longer feel the need to prove the existence of Southern material culture, it's time to begin asking what these objects tell us about the peoples, the places, and the cultures that produced them. With our partners at Drayton Hall, the Charleston Museum, the Historic Charleston Foundation, MESDA, and two dozen other public and private collections, Colonial Williamsburg recently brought together a grand assemblage of some 450 examples of outstanding objects made and used in the early South. They have come together in a five-year exhibition at the art museums of Colonial Williamsburg, and our goal is to see that as a group, they serve as a springboard for further research and examination. Now this evening, we've talked about ethnic influences that shape these objects but there are so many other topics waiting to be explored. I hope you'll have a chance to visit and see these compelling pieces of the Southern past firsthand and take part in that conversation. Thank you very much.